just had a major earthquake and looked up in the sky that night and the moon was red and it was sort of like shining down and like and the buildings were still shaking wow that was before i was in california um fjmc international i don't know who's logged in the fjmc account but if you could enable the record up oh, there we go recording is on so we will get started thank you very much gentlemen for uh for joining me uh this this afternoon and this evening um my my goal today is to let's see screen one i want no i want to share hang on one second give me one second i want to make sure i have here we go is to uh share this slide. perfect you should see now uh the title slide yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay good and then i have i default when i when i teach now having these automatic closed captions on on the bottom um they're about 80 to 90 percent accurate um but uh, if they get distracted let me know i can shut them off um as i was saying to a couple of folks before we had that before the technical glitch um al budman um asked me to uh, asked if anyone wanted to give talks during this the, the downtime uh and when he said how about something that's not necessarily judaic in nature i said well i could probably talk about astrophotography as best as i can so i titled the talk astrophotography for, for beginners because i consider myself a beginner uh the blind yeah, and the blind because I, I figured that um Okay. Stan would probably log in. Uh, he was there. He knows something about photography. Uh -huh. um, I didn't expect uh, my my former student Scott Shelf to log in, who's also a, a good yeah. photographer as well. Um, and I, my yeah. idea is that I would probably learn as much from putting the talk yeah. together yeah. as I would from giving the talk. So that's why I opted to do this particular topic. Um, here's my. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I get it. I get it. We're just gonna try and see if you can mute. You know, do it. And, yeah, see. If you can mute your I can't I'm not the host, so I can't mute. So if folks can self-mute, that would be great. And uh and you can hit the space bar uh if you want to talk as a push to talk thing. Okay, so we'll carry on. Uh organization for the talk. Um I'm gonna talk a little bit about it about so introductions, I'll have a little bit of Yiddishkeit. We'll talk about basic concepts in astronomy, basic concepts in photography, uh, and then put the two together to get astrophotography. So a little bit about me and, and astrophotography. Um, I, I became interested in astronomy in elementary school. I read every single astronomy book in my elementary school library, Central Elementary School in East Brunswick, New Jersey. By the time I got to junior high school, I had um, first seen the moon through binoculars. Um, when I ended up in um, college uh, at Cornell, I enrolled in Astro Astronomy 104, and Carl Sagan was the professor of record at the time, uh, but he gave one lecture. Uh, the grad students gave all the other lectures, so um, I was pretty much hooked on astronomy. In college, it was between astronomy and psychology. I ended up, as Scott will know, and many of you know as well, falling in love with, astron with, with psychology, even though I had a love for astronomy as well. Um, at Cornell, I, I bought off of a grad student a four-inch uh, Newtonian reflector uh, telescope for uh, for cheap. On the cheap, he was moving and needed and didn't want to move the telescope. And when I turned 40, my wife leveraged that. Uh, she wanted to get rid of it, so she said, "Listen, I'll buy you a new telescope that doesn't look like it was hacked together from stuff in a junkyard. If you get rid of the old one." I said, oh, "Okay, that sounds fine." So that was my 40th birthday present was a six-inch. Uh, Smith Cassegrain scope, which I'll uh, show you a picture of in a little bit later on. So that is really my own tr only training in astronomy and astrophotography is <coughs> what I've read from owning a telescope, what I've read from owning a camera, and what I've done and read online and learned from what little I could do uh, as well. So um, the, the little Yiddish guy I said, as Ben Zoma says in Pirkei Avot, who is wise is one who learns from every person. So I hope folks have stuff to say on this call as well. And uh, the, the other bit of Yiddishkeit I'll talk about uh, in terms of astro astrophotography, it can be an expensive hobby. Um, so uh, keep that in mind if you, if you have no idea what you're getting into. Um, you, you, I'll talk a little bit about pricing and stuff like this as we go through. My wife kind of, um, Gives me a little bit of a hard time when these little boxes and sometimes big boxes arrive from Amazon uh, and they're photography related as well. 
So just keep that in mind. Okay, some basic astronomy concepts that we need to know when we think about this. With very few exceptions, stuff I'm gonna show you today are very, very far away. Uh, and I've given some, uh, some of the objects we're gonna talk about today in, our, in, our, in, in the pictures I'm gonna share with you. The International Space Station, ISS, at closest approach, it's about 250 miles away from us. The moon's about a quarter of a million miles away and all the way out to the Andromeda galaxy, that's about 2.5 million light years away, with one light year being about five trillion, about six trillion miles. So these things are very, very far away. The other thing we need to keep in mind is that with very few exceptions, things that we see up in the sky are very large. The ISS is about a little bit larger than an American football field, but apologies to my Canadian friends. Uh, the moon is about 1,000 miles in diameter. Mars is about 2,500 miles in diameter. And then uh, we'll look at pictures of the sun, um, about 865,000 miles. Jupiter is, is huge, 43,000 miles, about 43 times the size of our moon. Uh, we look at the Orion Nebula, it's 12 light years wide, and the Andromeda Galaxy is 220,000 light years. So these are huge things, but they're also very, very far away, which makes things very difficult in terms of photography. We can see and we can take pictures of things easier if they're large and they're close, uh, and the other problem we have is that things in the sky move, or at least they appear to move. Um, many objects that we see in the sky have proper motion, but it really doesn't count that much in terms of photography. Proper motion is, is that the object itself is moving through space. And then, of course, planets will revolve around the sun and the moon revolves around the Earth, so they move as well. But the biggest cause of apparent movement in the sky is the fact that the Earth rotates. And in order to take good pictures, um, we either have to shoot fast enough so that the Earth's rotation doesn't smear things, uh, or shoot um, long enough with a device that counteracts the rotation of the Earth. We'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later on. But it makes life complicated because things move, and things are far, and things are not necessarily that large. The other thing we have is that taking pictures of things, particularly things that move, is easier when there's a lot of light. Um, and when we're doing astrophotography, we're in the dark. So another complex thing. Cameras can maximize the light that you get in by, by using them, by using what's called a fast lens, uh, using a long shutter speed, or using very sensitive film, and, and that's in quotes, or very sensitive sensors. Problem is fast lenses tend to be expensive and heavy, uh, and long shutter speeds aren't good when things move, like when the planet rotates. Uh, and the problem with this, the uh, fast sensors, the, uh, the, high, the very sensitive sensors, is that higher sensitivity in your camera on the DSLRs, uh, raising your ISO, for those of you who know something about cameras, comes with more visual noise. It's not as, as clean in terms of the pictures there. Questions or comments so far? We're good? Good. Okay. All right, so astrophotography capitalizes on the difficult and expensive parts of photography. We shoot in the dark, we shoot at objects that move, and we, use, we tend to have to use long shutter speeds, and we use as fast a lens as we can reasonably afford. Here's an example of what I mean when we talk about things that move. I don't know if you can see on this particular image, but you see these, they're not really dots, but the dots have smears. It looked like someone took them and kind of rubbed it this way. That's because if you shoot too long or with not long enough shutter speed, things move and you get blurry pictures. This slide shows you kind of the relationship among the things I was just talking about and gives us a, a, a common vocabulary. Um, the bigger lens, the faster lenses are the lenses with the smaller apertures. You see, oh, let me put a little laser thingy on. Give me one sec. Here we are. Okay. Here we are. Larger apertures, Gary. Larger apertures. Thank you. Uh, I don't know what I said before. What did I say before? Smaller apertures, smaller, smaller numbers. Yes, smaller f-stops, larger numbers. apertures. Yep, smaller f-stops, these numbers here are larger apertures. Um, and the, the, the larger the f-stop, the smaller the aperture. We want to be shooting for astrophotography. I, I have a couple of shots here that are at 5.6. Most of the ones I'm going to show you are at 2.8. I don't have any at 2 or 1.4 because I don't have lenses that expensive. Um, these are all show you what typical shutter speeds are for motion blur. For many astrophotography pictures, we're looking at exposure times in seconds, not fractions of seconds. And the pictures I'm going to show you today are mostly ISO between 400 and 3200. I think I have one or two shots at 12,800. 
but you're going to get a lot of noise here as well. This, this diagram kind of shows you the concepts I was just talking about. All right, so for basic astrophotography, what do you need? Minimally, you need a camera you can set to fully manual. Manual focus, manual aperture, manual ISO, manual shutter speed, and ideally you need a self timer at, at, at a minimum. Uh, you need a solid tripod, a reasonably fast lens, and I like to use electrical tape as, as something I'll, I'll talk about in just a moment. Let me highlight these. Um, manual focus, uh, this is a pic these are pictures from my camera that I've stolen off the web. Uh, you want to set it for manual focus, you want to be fully manual, use the M setting on your camera. Uh, you want to set your ISO, be able to set your ISO as well. These are two of the lenses that I took many of the pictures you'll see today in. This is a uh, 70 to 200, 28 lens from Tamron, and this is a Sigma 17 to 50, 28 lens. Uh, both of these are my, on my Sony camera. You need a really solid tripod. When I'm using um, astrophotography, I, I have a Bogan tripod that looks a lot like this. It's really heavy uh, because you don't want things to move around. I also have a it's not great for astrophotography. The reason why a self-timer is needed is because if you push the button on, on a camera, even if it's on a solid tripod, once the, the um, shutter opens, the camera is going to move a tiny bit, and that's going to cause blur if the, camera's, if the shutter is open for a long period of time. So if you have a self-timer, you can set it for like three seconds, hit the button, let go, the camera's vibrations will die down about three to ten seconds, it'll take the picture, shutter will close, and you're good. Electrical tape is because you want manual focus. And what I'll do is I'll focus the camera and usually you're in the dark, you don't want to bump it. So I'll take black electrical tape and I'll put a piece of tape on the camera lens so it won't change the focus of it. Um, I learned that trick from a buddy of mine, Steve Freeman. I talk, talk about learning from other folks. If you want to go the next step up, a remote shutter release, uh, perhaps with an intervalometer is good. You see up here in the top left. This is a cable that plugs into your camera so that you hit the button on the remote and the camera doesn't move when you release the shutter. Uh, you can use a telescope. Uh, this is a picture of, uh, that I stole on the internet of my telescope. This is what it's set up with. Uh, this is called a T adapter. Over here, the T adapter connects to the back of your telescope. It hooks onto your camera that you can see my camera connected down here. Uh, if you want to take shots of the sun, you need a solar filter. Uh, this is a picture of a solar filter that I have that I took some eclipse pictures I'll show with you later on. And this is something I don't have that is probably going to show up in an Amazon box sometime in the next year or two, much to my wife's chagrin. This is an auto tracker. Um, this is a device that you put on, on a tripod, and if you orient it to the North Star if you're the, from the Northern Hemisphere and set it at your um, level of latitude, yeah, I think it's latitude, uh, might be longitude, that's why it's a beginner, um, then it will actually move at the opposite direction at the same rate that the Earth is rotating, and you can take really long exposure pictures without any motion blur. But they're expensive, um, so I don't have one of those yet. Hello, Benny. Bob, you have a question? No, no, I was. I think it's longitude because the because that's the latitude. horizontal. Yes, yes, it's it's, it's it, the, like the equator, but higher. Yeah. Yes, if you're at the equator, it would be flat. If you're up in our neck of the woods, it's going to be just slightly uh, tilted. Latitude. La latitude. Thank you, Stan. Altitude, latitude. Sense. What was that? Equator. Altitude, latitude above the equator. Longitude is away from Greenwich. And from, yeah, Greenwich. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, let's see. Aside from equipment, what do you need? You need dark skies, clear skies. Most of the time, you're going to need warm clothes. Um, even in Southern California, we were, I'll show you some pictures from Mount Pinos that I was at later, a little bit later on. Um, and it got cold. Uh, and you need a lot of patience. And, you need to, and the other thing I'll say is you need to lower your expectations. Um, everyone thinks they're going to you know, they have a telescope, and you get these great images, and they're going to look just like the Hubble. And, and, and they don't. The Hubble is a multi-million dollar, hundreds of million dollar telescope that's orbiting above the atmosphere. So always have clear skies. It's, it's, um, you need to be able to sort of get excited by what you see, not what you're hoping to see. Um, and that being said, I think it, it's, still, it's still fun to do. Let's talk a little bit about sky conditions. There's a, a, a rating system called the Bortle Sky Classes. Uh, and they're uh, I'm at the bottom of this slide, and I'll, I'll share, happy to share these notes with you guys later on, two websites where you could find dark sky sites near you. But just give you an idea of what the ratings are. They go one to nine. Uh, number one, 
I've never been in. It's an excellent dark sky site. Uh, you're going to see in an excellent dark, you'll be able to see the Milky Way uh, and the Andromeda Galaxy with your naked eye, and the, the ga galactic core of the Milky Way will be so bright that it ca actually casts a shadow. Never seen a Bortle Sky Class 1. Sky Class 2, I have a couple of slides in this show that I'll show you in a few minutes, where I was at, a, a, I think, a Bortle Sky 2. Um, sky 5 is pretty much typical suburban sky. You'll see the Milky Way pretty weak. Most of us are going to be somewhere between 5 and 8, it's at, at 8. You're going to see a sky glowing milky white or orange, depending on whatever the light pollution is like. Uh, you won't be able to see many stars in the inner city. Uh, very few bright star stars are visible. So, so um, that's one thing we need to look at here. Here's an example of a decent suburban sky. Um, this is a picture I took of the Milky Way. This is the, I don't know if you could see it on your slide here, but this is the Milky Way rising mm -hmm. above my backyard. Uh, that's my neighbor in the bathroom over there. Uh, but this is this is what an example of what probably a Bortle Sky 5 would look like. But keep in mind, this is an eight second exposure, right? So um, it, you're, you're, you're not going to see this with your naked eye. It'll come up with, when you're gathering up all the light that comes in. I'll talk more about that in a moment. Winter is better than summer. Uh, the winter typically has clearer skies and less humidity. Uh, in fact, warm air is unstable air. Uh, if you're shooting uh, a, an astrophoto a target astrophotography that's over a building in the summer, the building's going to radiate heat, particularly, the, and the air is going to shimmer, and that's going to mess up your image um, pretty, pretty terribly. Uh, so something to consider um, once the travel ban is lifted and the quarantine is lifted, go to dark sky sites. Um, I've been to Zion National Park. Uh, that's probably the closest to a Bortle II that I've gone, and Mount Pinos is relatively close to a Bortle II as well. So that's something to think about. So um, now that we know what we are looking for to, in terms of equipment, locations, and conditions, any questions I can answer here first before we jump in? I know in Pennsylvania, there's uh, Cherry Spring Park, which is in yes. the center, north center part of Pennsylvania. Yes. And uh, it's got super dark skies. Yes. I, I, I was in Pittsburgh for many years, never got there. But, but I've heard about it. Um, the fact that I, uh, that Mount Pinos is so close to LA is something that I was really excited to discover. Anyone else know of dark sky sites near them? We just had to cancel a trip we had scheduled to burn it, Texas, outside of Austin. I was going to go with my brothers and uh, take some pictures of the dark sky there. But uh, no, no telescope that we were lugging around, uh, but they had telescopes to borrow. Nice, nice. Mount Pinos here in LA, it's about two hours north of LA, up in the mountains. Um, they have sky star parties periodically. That's something to look for in terms of local resources. When I was up there, they had um, like 24 inch uh, Dobsonian telescopes mounted on like um, trailers that folks were, were sharing, allowing folks to look through as well. That was uh, quite an experience. So oftentimes you don't need a telescope, people will have them there lit. My, my wife was when I went up to Mount Pinos, she said, well, you're going to bring your telescope. I said, I, I don't think so. I mean, mine is a, is a six inch Smith Cassegrain. Uh, and there were telescopes that were orders of magnitude larger than mine. Um, so, but it's fun anyway. Okay, so let's look at some images. And we'll talk about how they're captured and, and maybe we'll get some ideas as to what we're looking at. This is one of the first um, pictures I took of the moon in terms of an astrophotography image. Uh, this was taken in 2010. And uh, this will give us some common uh, ways of looking at it. If you don't have, um, let me think of how I want to say this differently. What I, how I set this up, I, didn't, I couldn't connect my camera directly to the telescope. So I had my telescope trained on the moon, and I had a tripod set up next to the telescope, and I shot through the eyepiece of the telescope to get this image. It's a little washed out, uh, even though it was at one four thousandth of a second, for some reason I shot it at a very high. So, with a 30 millimeter lens. It's not a, not a great shot, but I was happy to get a picture of the moon out of my telescope. Over time, I got a little better. Um, I went out and bought a T-adapter, and this is what it looks like if you connect it directly up to a, a telescope. Uh, it's still, no, the moon is very bright when it's, when, it's, when it's full. So this is shooting at 1 3200th of a second at 400 ISO. The, F, uh, the, the um, aperture of the telescope is, is F10 and it's the equivalent of like a 1500 millimeter lens. 
Uh, this is shot through the back of the scope. You can see uh, this is the right at the bottom, and a little bit of coloring in the, the, the Mari of the moons as well. Shooting the moon at full moon is, is impressive and it's very bright and you get a, uh, generally you get a pretty good image, but you don't get a lot of definition and a lot of uh, shadowing on the craters. The best time to shoot the moon is uh, when it's at some kind of a, of, a, of a gibbous or a crescent phase. If you see here in this gibbous moon, this was shot in 2016, it's, it's darker because it's only half a moon, 1 to 160 at that 200. Again, shot on my telescope, but you can see the shadows in the craters along the Terminator, this line here between the light and dark side, the lit and the dark side of the moon. Uh, you can see the craters pop out a lot better because of the low angle of the sun around here. Um, so I find shooting the moon when it's um, not full is actually much better. The other advantage of shooting when the moon is not full is that if the particular moon is a crescent moon is you could shoot other things in the sky as well. When the moon is out and the moon is full, it brightens and washes out the whole sky. It's very hard to see other sorts of objects here. Here's a shot of the crescent moon. You can see, actually, this is one of my favorite spots here. Down here is near the, um, this is sort of near the Aiken Basin where I think we're gonna be sending our next uh, manned ex uh, explorers. That'll be down here. Uh, but you can see craters that are side lit from the sun coming in from this angle. Uh, this was shot uh, one one hundredth of a second. Uh, at 1600, so a little bit faster um, sense of shutter speed here. But you get a lot more definition around the Terminator, this edge of it here. The other nice thing about shooting the crescent moon is if you adjust your camera right and the conditions are right, you can get earth shine. Uh, so this is the same moon the same night, but what I've done is I've, I've overexposed the crescent moon and, uh, and to get out this dark side, it's not really the dark side because we would see this if we were in a different part of the moon's orbit, but you can see this part of the moon is being lit up not by the sun, which is over here, this is being lit up by the reflection of light from the earth. Uh, and sometimes it's a, it's a neat picture to try and grab. Uh, I find you can generally get better earth shine pictures in the winter than in the summer, one because the air is clearer and there's more reflectivity of the, of the, of the, of the northern hemispheres when there's more snow out. Uh, but uh, anyway, I th thought that's a pretty cool picture. Gary? Yes. You ever tried layering? Yes. Uh, I'll talk about that. <laughs> that that's um, that one I think will be the the astrophotography for next then beginners. Um, I've tried layering in Photoshop and failed miserably. I've tried layering using a program called Auto Stackert uh, mm -hmm. for deep sky images. In fact, that I spent an entire day in jury duty trying to get that to work and fail miserably as well. But, but I, I've seen people do it and do it well. What Stan is talking about is you take images at different exposures and you can combine them in a certain way that you get, so I can essentially get, let me back up, I can get this beautiful definition of the curve in the same picture of this nicely lit up um, Earthshine moon. I, I, can't, I can't do it well. Um, but I'll, I'll leave that to others. Maybe there'll be another talk for another one once I figure that out. Nine times out of 10, if you see a shot that's, that, that's really got that kind of contrast range in it, they layered it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I can identify, I just can't produce it. <laughs> Send those two photos to me, Gary, I'll work on it. I'm good with Photoshop. Uh, uh, Scott? Yeah. Is that Scott? Absolutely happy to send you that. Would, okay. a, cam would a camera with HDR uh, help in a situation like that where the HDR takes multiple photos and then layers them? Yes, but um, I found with HDR is that it wants to do its own settings to optimize the image. And I can't on my camera set it to do built-in HDR with, with a set of, per, uh, of, of shutter exposure and stuff that I want it to do. Essentially, you're doing HDR, what, what, what Stan is talking about is you're doing HDR in software later on. I just am not good at that. Um, is yet is probably a good way of saying it. I'm not good at that yet. All right, um, we're, we're going to move from the moon to a little bit farther out in the atmosphere, uh, in the in the in the in the universe, if you want the solar system. Another thing that's nice to take pictures of are conjunctions. Conjunctions are where two or more things appear near each other uh, in the sky. This was shot from my backyard. It's a two-second exposure uh, with a 40 millimeter lens, so it's a wide-angle lens. And what you see right over the top of my neighbor's chimney is Venus. And this brighter reddish dot over here is Mars. 
Uh, Venus is a very, very bright and very, very boring object to photograph. Uh, it's largely cloud covered. Um, it does have phases, but you're going to need a telescope to see the phases of Venus. Uh, and I found that it all you get, all you usually get, is a whitish, whitish, bluish, round blob when I take pictures of it. But it's it's pretty, and to see it with your naked eyes, it's really beautiful, uh, particularly when it shows up with other planets in the sky. In 2017, I think Mars was relatively far away. You want to shoot Mars and other planets ideally when they're in uh, when they're on the same side of the sun as we are. If they're on the opposite side of the sun, you can't see them. But if they're well on the opposite side of the sun, they're much, much smaller. So the closer they are, the better they are to get. This is a relatively um, small shot of it. <clears throat> Moving farther out in the solar system. Hey, Gary. You see, yes. So it sounds like there's a lot of planning involved with this. Uh, in photography, we talk about planning like for time of day and the golden hour right before the sun goes down, things like that. This sounds like the extreme when you have to know when Mars is closest to the Earth, which could be months away. Yes, a lot of planning. Um, I'll talk about planning a little bit more when I get to the solar eclipse shots. Um, but something that can help you with planning, there are um, two apps that I rely on very much in my, on, on my phone. One is Pocket Universe. Um, I think it's, it's a pay app, but that's what sort of what it looks like. Uh, and Pocket Universe will tell you at any time what's up in the, in the sky. Uh, it'll show you the um, orrery, which is sort of where the planets are. Um, there are other, um, you could sort of identify from other websites. Sky and Telescope has websites that'll tell you where things are in the sky in certain months if you don't want to go that route. Gary, Skyview for Android is excellent. Skyview is another great app. The other one I, that I use uh, to, to look for galaxy pictures is something called PhotoPills. PhotoPills um, has a um, night augmented reality uh, function. So you could hold, I don't know if you can see it on here now, it's bad with my background. Uh, PhotoPills has an augmented reality. You can take it outside at night, hold up your phone, it'll show you where the Milky Way is. And you can fast forward and show where it's going to be a little bit later on. Uh, it's, it's great, it, it's great to sort of plan things out. You really have to know where these things are. Uh, Baseweather.com. What was that? baseweather.com you can sign up for um texts or emails yep. and they'll tell you when the conjunctions are happening they'll also tell you if there's uh something interesting in the sky at, at immediately like yep. if there's an aurora yeah space weather and uh time and date is another, i think i have another one that i use as well um uh, great all right so let's uh move a little bit further out in the solar system jupiter um, this was shot um, through the IP, I, again, IP through my telescope back in 2010. Um, these are the four Galilean satellites. These are the ones, so this is similar to what Galileo saw when he first put his telescope up to the sky. This is overexposed Jupiter. It's very, very bright because the moons are very dim. Uh, I'm going to guess here. This is probably Io because it's closest. Uh, and the rest is just a guess. Uh, there's Ganymede, Callisto, and Europa. Uh, and I don't know which one of those four there are, but you could there, but uh, Pocket Universe will tell you. Uh, you can take a picture of it or look through your telescope, look up Pocket Universe, hit moons of Jupiter. It'll tell you, label exactly which ones are which. It's, it's a pretty cool thing to do. Um, the thing with Jupiter and its moons is it's very hard, unless you do layering like Stan was talking about, to get a really good image of the planetary disk and the moons itself. Um, here's a later shot of Jupiter I took just last year. Um, you could, this, this is about as good as it gets for me right now until you do, there's something else you can do besides stacking. It's, it's similar to stacking where you take a number of shorter exposure pictures. No, you, it's, it's stacking. And you stack them on top of each other uh, and you run it for hours on, a, on a, an i7 processor and it comes up with a really crystal clear picture. It's another thing I haven't done well at all. But if you Gary, look carefully, Gary. Yes, in my telescope, I can normally see the white disc with two black clouds going across and i can see them a little bit here right um, here but and right yeah, here they the the two black bands going across the disc are very very clear to see usually yes i agree this is one of the first times that actually i was actually able to get color as well but i usually see you're right um just a white disc with the black bands yeah uh, when, when i when i focus it down uh and again this is with the t adapter um, Saturn. Saturn is an amazing thing the first time you see it through a scope. 
Um, this was shot last year. This was at, the other cool thing about Saturn is that you can watch it over time and the ring plane will rotate, let me do this, up and down uh, over, I think it's a 22 year cycle, where I think we're about seven or eight years from when the rings will be edge on compared to the Earth. So you'll take, you'll look at Saturn through the telescope and the rings are gone. Right, and then a couple of, then they get thinner and thinner, th thicker and thicker and thicker, then they, they go back down, back and forth. So this was shot, the, I think this was, um, I don't remember where it was in terms of where the rings were, but you can see the disk of the planet, you can see the rings. And this is one of my better shots of, of Saturn. I think it's probably the best one that I have. But to give an idea, this is heavily cropped, right? So I took the image, and I wanna show you what the original image looks like. And this goes to this notion of, of lowering your expectations. Right, that's the original image that I had in my in my telescope that you can actually see. And there it is. It's right down there, uh, and you blow it up enough, and uh, and you get you get this. Um, so make sure your expectations are in check. How are we doing time wise? Five oh nine. Okay. Uh, even farther out, let's look at Orion. This was my first attempt ever at astrophotography. I had a uh, old Kodak point and shoot camera that I could set for a 15 second exposure. I put it on a tripod, stuck it in my background, backyard, pointed it at Orion and, and got this picture. thought, wow, this is pretty cool. Uh, but that's all I could pretty much do at the time. I wanna draw your attention here. This is the, the, the constellation Orion. A uh, couple things I wanna highlight here. One, this star up here that my the laser printer, Betelgeuse, the top shoulder of the hunter, um, has until recently been dimming. Uh, this, it's much brighter in this picture than it was recently. It's now getting brighter again. They actually thought it was gonna go supernova if it kept dimming, and dimming but sometime between now and the next 100,000 years. But now it's brightening again, so it likely is not gonna happen. Um, here's the Orion's belt, and here's the dagger. The reason why I wanna highlight this dagger is because in the dagger area of Orion, is a nebula that's that's you can see with your naked eyes under really clear skies or if you have a decent telescope you can get a picture of it here are those three stars in the dagger i just talked about and this is the orion nebula that i was able to get in 2015 with my telescope 3200 so it's very it's a little noisy um two second exposure so i'm getting a little but you can see some really nice nebulosity in here and if you look carefully in the center of the nebula there are four stars in there that's called the trapezium um, it's hard to shoot the trapezium and the nebulosity at the, at the same time. Um, that's what, why I, I pretty much, I like this image a lot. This is modestly cropped. I don't remember exactly where the original image came from, but this is something you can, you can find easily because you, you can find the dagger and the belt stars of Orion and you have a telescope or really dark skies, look to, just to the right of the dagger and there it is. Uh, it, it'll look like a little faint smudge uh, in your, in, with the naked eye. Andromeda, this is the farthest thing you can see with the naked eyes. This is 2.5 million light years away. The good news is, is it's getting closer to us every day. Um, it's actually rushing towards our galaxy, the Milky Way. Uh, and uh, somewhere I think in the next million years, we're going to collide with it. Uh, it will be largely a, a lot of nothingness because most of this galaxy is empty space and most of our galaxy is empty space. It'll end up forming just probably uh, a couple of million years from now, uh, several million years, a large spherical galaxy, which usually happens when these two things collide. But if you can't see it, it's this very faint fuzzy here. Um, here's the center disk of the Andromeda galaxy. I'm putting my light to right now. And this is pretty much what you see in the telescope in suburban skies. I shot this from my backyard uh, in 2017. Uh, with a relatively high exposure, wide open lens, and I had my um, camera, uh, my Tamron lens, 180 millimeters, uh, when it was taken. They're hard to see. If the sky were darker, this would come out. The blue you see in the background is because my white balance was funky. I didn't, I didn't correct it. Um, but this, like I said, on the lower expect, this is not what you see with the Hubble. Um, but this is an example of what you can see something that's really, really, really far away. If we go from Andromeda instead move away uh, instead of the solar system and the galaxy to darker places, I want to show you some pictures from dark skies. 
Um, this I shot near the entrance of Zion National Park. This down here is the entrance drive that you can drive into the park. Here's the Watchman Mountains. These are clouds. And this here is the Milky Way. And the dark patch you see here are dust lanes in the Milky Way. Uh, this was shot with just a regular camera, no telescope, a very wide angle lens. It was a 30 second exposure. Um, something I, I, I skipped over real quickly. If you have a very wide exposure, you can get a long, you can get away with long. Let me start this sentence again. If you have a very wide angle lens, you can get away with longer exposure times because the Earth doesn't move as much. If you have a very narrow lens or a very high powered lens, you 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 can only have shorter exposure times because the movement of the Earth is going to blur some of the stars that you see. So we, we get very little star movement in here. We, got a, a, we collected a lot of light in this image. Um, I like it, although I, I wish I could think differently here. This probably would benefit from layering had I grabbed some um, lighter shots of the images here. Uh, in August of 2018, um, I and my son Josh and my buddy Steve Friedman, who was one of my photo photography gurus, trekked up to Mount Pinos for the Perseid meteor shower. Uh, Mount Pinos is one of the few dark sky sites in Southern California. Uh, we arrived there around 7 o'clock at night. This was taken around 7 o'clock at night. Here's my boat and tripod. Uh, here's Josh eating dinner. Uh, my camera bag is laid out on a table in this meadow we are in. Uh, by 9, this shot is 9 o'clock at night. So 9 o'clock in August. It's still pretty bright out. This is a 13 second exposure. You can see the entire Milky Way coming up over Mount Pinos. Um, just stunning and beautiful and starting to get cold. August, top of the mountain, we're about, uh, I think Mount Pinos is around 8,000 feet, 9,000 feet. Um, I bundled up, but um, didn't bundle up enough. Uh, it was starting to get chilly. Uh, by 10 o'clock at night, the media, the uh, sky is really dark. You can see a little bit of sky over here, but down here is a beautiful shot of a blue light meteor. Uh, blue light is largely a, a, a dense, rocky metal stone here that you can see it glows very, very bright when it was able to get. This was a 15 second exposure um, taken at a relatively high, high sensitivity. Uh, one downside of trying to get pictures of meteors is that you miss a lot of them that show up in the sky. So Josh, as you saw, was lying back in a chair. There's one, there's one, there's one. And Steve and I are through our, looking through our camera lenses. I think I saw about 15 in the entire night. I think my son Josh saw about 40 or 50 of them. So there's a trade-off, right? If you're trying to capture them, you're gonna see fewer of them. Uh, otherwise, you're not. Uh, meteors are, are fun and frustrating to shoot. Um, what I will typically do during a meteor shower is I'll try and get to the darkest place I can, bring a chair, a blanket, um, set my camera up on a tripod, put on the intervalometer so it shoots like a 15 second picture constantly at one section of the sky. And then it'll shoot maybe six, 700 pictures Till the battery dies uh, and then I go home and the next morning I look at all the pictures and I get maybe three or four uh, and the good news is they stand out pretty quickly when you're looking for them so that's one strategy you can use to get meteor shots. More close to home so let's talk about adventures in daytime astrophotography. Back in 2012 uh, there was a transit of Venus. This perfectly cir circular black dot is Venus traveling across the surface of the sun. Uh, from where we're standing on Earth. Uh, this is a relatively rare event. The last transit of Venus happened in the late 1800s, and the next one that will be visible from Earth is going to happen in December of 2117. So mark your calendars, it's a bit far off. I happened to be wandering around the neighborhood. Um, no, I was in my backyard trying to get pictures of this, um, but I did not have a solar filter, so I was very unsuccessful. And Lynn was wandering the neighborhood with our dog, and found our neighbor out there with his telescope, same one as mine, but an eight-inch version with the solar uh, filter on it. I had the T adapter, so I ran over there, and together we, we got a bunch of pictures of this. This is one of my favorite shots of this. But you see also, this is with a solar filter. You need a solar filter to shoot pictures of the sun. It's, uh, you'll damage your eyes, you'll damage your equipment. It's, it's, you need a, a very good solar filter to shoot good pictures of the sun. Right after the transit of Venus, I went out and got my own. Uh, but the other thing I want to highlight on this image here is you see sunspots. Uh, back in 2012, the, the Earth was in a, start again, back in 2012, the sun 
was in a relatively active sunspot phase. And there were a lot of sunspots uh, that were visible here. And you could see those with solar filters. If we look, go forward in time a little bit, um, this is last year, November of 2019. This is the transit of Mercury. Transit of Mercury is a little bit more common. Mercury is a lot tinier than Venus. Here's Mercury right up here, that little tiny dot you see up here. Very, very tiny. But the other thing you notice about the surface of the sun uh, is that it, there's no sunspots. The, moon, the, the sun right now is in a very dormant phase in terms of sunspots. This was shot with my telescope with a solar filter as well. Uh, Timeanddate.com will tell you when the next uh, transit is going to be. The other exciting thing you can try and do if you have a solar filter is get another, uh, is look for an ISS transit. This website, transitfinder.com, actually I think there might be a hyphen in it. I'll double check that when we're done. Uh, you plug in where your location is, you plug in how far you're willing to drive, and you plug in, um, it knows the date and time, and you hit calculate, and it'll list all the possible solar and lunar transits that the ISS will be where you can photograph it or see it. Um, I, one actually was occurring literally in the parking lot of my synagogue on February 18th of 2020. Uh, grabbed my telephone scope and a couple of buddies went out there and uh, you have to time it just right. It's all pretty much fake. Time and date will tell you the exact time it starts and the exact time it stops. You wait, wait for it to on your iPhone to come up at the exact time, hit the shutter button, it, goes, it shoots all the pictures. You, if you get two or three uh, with a good camera, you're lucky. Um, this is the actual image I shot. There's the ISS and if I scroll through these you'll be able to see it travel across. Here it is again. The face of the of the sun. So it's a challenge. It's a challenge to get. Uh, we doing on time. Okay, almost done. Here's another thing you can do: chase eclipses. So here's uh, my camera with the Tamron lens on a shaky tripod. Notice the angle of this tripod. Matthew, my son's brother, caught it when I bumped it and almost knocked it over when we were in Missouri. Uh, Josh, my son here, and I were driving in this car. He had two iPads on him. One was tracking the weather. One was tracking where we were relative to the center line of the eclipse as we were traveling down Route 70. It was cloudy and stormy out most of that day. Finally, at about 12.50, we called it. We pulled over on the uh, Route 65 off-ramp, set up our stuff, and in a few minutes later, I was able to get this shot of the total solar eclipse for Missouri, which was just breathtaking. The picture is amazing, but seeing a total solar eclipse is another entirely different experience. Set your calendars April 8th, 2024. There's a solar eclipse that'll be going from Louisiana all the way up through Maine, I think, into Canada, Stan, um, is the path of totality. If you can get to there to see it, go and see it. I think Lynn and I are going to try and catch it in Maine. That place in... I'm sorry, David? The place in, in Burnett, Texas, has a... We'll see the eclipse there. Yeah, you don't need a dark sky. It happens during the day, right? But, uh, but yeah, if you can get to someplace where there's clear skies, that's the key. Um, here's some lunar eclipses. This is when the sun is here, the earth is here, and the moon is here, and the, the earth shadow passes across the moon. You get a, um, a, a beautiful reddish moon image, a blood moon. Uh, this is the closest stand I can get to stacking. I just took a bunch of pictures and just used auto stacker and had them plot each one on, uh, over as it goes through. Uh, these are 17 images exposed um, one after another. And you can see how the shadow of the Earth crosses the moon into totality that you see here. Uh, an intervalometer is a device you hook up to your, your camera that will shoot pictures every few seconds is a, is a great way to do this. I think the last set of pictures I have are um, rocket launches, other things you can do. I happen to be fortunate enough to live near Vandenberg. Um, and so, I'm on a uh, email list uh, that a buddy of mine, um, Webb, I forgot his first name. Anyway, he has uh, his email list. He calls publicly available data for when rocket launches are going to occur out of Vandenberg. Uh, I found a great spot in Moore Park near me that's up above uh, of this big hilltop, and it's a direct shot to Vandenberg, which is out here. So, uh, which is probably about 90 miles. This is 90 miles away, and you can take some pretty cool shots. This is the last. Delta II rocket ever being launched. It launched the ISAT-2 back in September 15th of 2018. This is uh, 130 images that I took that I stacked one on top of each other. 
So you can see that the Earth moved a little bit in this. You see the blurring of, this, of the stars over here, but you see the beautiful trajectory of the, of the rocket, how the, the bright flame of it took off, and then it gets dimmer as it gets further on uh, in its launch. Here's a shot of a Falcon 9. Uh, this is a heavily cropped Falcon 9 shot from my back patio. Uh, 200 millimeters. Uh, I have some other shots of this as well, but you can see the blue flame as, as it goes. Uh, the rocket is actually here. Uh, this is the cooler blue flame that comes out the back. This is staging of that Falcon 9 launch. You can see as the booster rockets come off and separate. And there's a close up of main engine of the, of the second stage uh, igniting and off it goes. This is the same picture I saw before of the Falcon 9. Here's a shot of a Falcon 9 launch. Uh, again, stacked, you can see the, sm the smears here. This is my backyard, these are my backyard neighbors. We, we saw Venus above this guy's chimney before. This is an example of multiple shots taken over here. Falcon 9 and Vandenberg, and this is my favorite Vandenberg shot. This is one image. Uh, this was a twilight launch. This was happening just after sunset. So you can see the sun is setting here in the west. Vandenberg is well over here. Um, this is the contrail of the first stages coming back to land at Vandenberg, the Falcon 9. This is the exhaust plume that you see of the main engine and the Falcon 9 engine taking off. Um, this is the um, shock cone of the rocket as it's going forward, and here's the moon. Um, I have this picture in my office uh, as well. Uh, here's my neighbors over here. Um, and I think that's all I have. So that's, um, yeah, that's all the pictures that I have. Uh, so thank you very much for participating. Thank you for logging in. And thanks for your comments and, 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 and questions. Um, some other resources. I was, I was actually working on a resource slide when, when Dan Granite logged in and, and kept me from adding an additional slide. Uh, but look at your local astronomy clubs um, the astronomy associations in uh, here in Moore Park. Moore Park College has the Ventura County uh, Astronomical Association. There's an astronomical association pretty much in every city. Um, they'll have experts in their groups that can do astrophotography and teach you more about the, the sky. Um, check out the websites that we were talking about. Stan mentioned um, spaceweather.com. Time and date is another one. Transitfinder.com is another one. Sky and Telescope. There's lots of resources on the website. And there's more than just me and the FJNC that does astrophotography. Um, Mitch Ross has taken some really nice pictures as well uh, down in Arizona. Um, and I think Ron Chick up in Massachusetts, I think, is also into at least astronomy, if not astrophotography. So let me pause here. I'll open the floor for any questions. Uh, and thank you very much uh, for joining me tonight. Thanks for sharing, Gary. Thank you, sure. Gary. Great. So does anyone else have any experience shooting pictures of, of uh, astro astronomical objects? I have tried just a little bit trying to hold my uh, uh, iPhone up, but it doesn't work very well. And you really, there are some possibilities where you can actually get a, what looks like a lens that goes into the telescope, but it's actually a camera. And I've, I've been looking at a couple of these and, and saying, should I buy it, shouldn't it? They get pretty expensive very quickly. And you need a very stable platform for it. It makes it uh, a little more difficult. But uh, I think you did a great job. It's, it's a, a pleasure to, to listen to it. And uh, I wish you a, a very wonderful Pesach. And, Thank you, you uh, too. How did you actually get on the list to speak? What did you? I was on a call that, that Al was on. And I said, hey, I can do it. Real, right. real quick, this is something you can get for your iPhone. Okay. Right? It, 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 your iPhone sits in here. And this is a, a tripod now, right? So, right. If, and you can get apps that allow you to do a longer exposures on your iPhones, but you need a stable platform. You need to be able to put it on a tripod. Otherwise, it's, it's too blurry. You can't hold it with your hand. Gary, it's Alan from Brookline, Massachusetts. Yes, I noticed in your background, just over your uh, left shoulder, is a Radio Shack TRS-80 Model 1. Yes, does, it, it does it still work, and what are you using it for? Or is it, 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 uh, would your wife just call it a dust collector? Um, no, my wife calls that an object of hatred. Uh, <laughs> so it still works. Um, I actually have two of them. 
um, ones below. Um, it, the, I've been tinkering with them for about seven or eight years. It's actually the first computer I ever owned. Not that particular, not this particular one, right? I was able to get, get set uh, over over time uh, later on. And uh, when this is another hobby of mine is is vintage computers. Uh, that actually came up in an LDI meeting once uh, when people were, were talking about that. But yes, it does work. And that there are two five and a quarter inch floppy drives that are working there as well. Very good. Back in 1970. Six, I think it came out, 76, 77. I actually used to work for Radio Shack in the Springfield, Massachusetts area. And I'm very happy to say that I was the first person in the greater Springfield area to actually have sold one. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, district, the district manager said, okay, guys, we're in the uh, computer business. I want you to go out and sell these things. And of course, nobody knew what the hell they were selling, except it was a computer. And the only exposure that anybody had to computers is what was in any science fiction movie at the time. That's right. Or if they were um, programming on, on mainframes. Um, I started working for Radio Shack in 1983 and finished up when I went to grad school in 89. Um, but, but loved it. Loved working there. It was a great company. Hey, Gary? Yeah, Dave. Um, uh, it's Bob. Oh, it's Bob, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, what's your, your main DSLR is a uh, Sony, you said? Yeah. Yeah, and I've seen it at you know uh, at LDI and other places. Yep. But if I can ask a like a down in the weeds question, I noticed you're using Tamron lenses instead of. I mean, I know they're are they more reasonable? Are they as good as uh, so? But are they as good as Sony or the OEM lenses? This is the Tamron. Um, I yeah. love this Tamron lens. Um, I, the Sony lenses are are probably about thirty to forty percent more. Um, mm. This is this is my pride and joy. Uh, I get rock solid images with the Tamron, even at two eight. Um, mm -hmm. But it's 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 heavy. It's really really. That's heavy. a two eight. What fifteen? What is that? seventy to two hundred? Yeah, seventy to two hundred. But yeah. two eight. So that's still a chunk of change if it's a two eight, right? Yeah, uh, that, I think that lens was around eight hundred dollars when I got it when my son was a sophomore in high school. So that would have been 2009, I think. Yeah, because I needed, he, he went from playing freshman football on Thursday afternoons to JV football on Friday nights. And I was a team photographer. I needed a fast lens. So you needed, yeah. yeah, yeah. The, um, I'm less impressed with the Sigma lens. The Sigma lens I have on my camera now um, is the 70 to 50. It's the wide angle one that I have. When I shoot that at 2.8, um, I find it to be very soft. The focus is not really hard, not really sharp. Um, so I shoot that at 3.2, I go down to 3.2, it gets, I think I get better images from it. But that Tamron is a great lens. It's a great, great. great lens. I know Stan, if you have, if you, if you have better experience with other, with bigger lenses than I do. I, I have always used the same lenses through the range because the colors are balanced. That's the difference. It, and if you, if you look, you can see that the colors will change with different lenses if they're not the same brand. Um, when they when they design a lens, they actually design it to, to match colors at certain points. And interesting. Color, not never using thought the same. Pardon? Never thought about that. That's interesting. Well, no, I, I, that was yeah, that was that was when we were really geeky and we were learning that stuff. Um, a few years ago, a friend of mine, um, a guy I went to school with, who was in town. He has a company called Kinoflow, which uh, he he won an Oscar for uh, from um, technical. It could, because of the lights he did. We we're, were looking at lighting charts and he went, oh my God, 40 years later, it all came back to me like, you know, like that. There it is, I see it all. Um, but, but the reason you want to use the same ones is because the, the colors match all through the lenses. If you're using, a, using an Olympus set or a Nikon or a Canon and you've got, you pull the, the wide angle, um, the colors are gonna match when you go to the telephoto. Yeah. And you're not going to have the, the there. You can tell a difference between them sometimes. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're also matched for the for the sensors too now, right? In the old days, you, when they were building a lens, you, you made it for Kodachrome or Ektachrome, right? Now you build it for the lens you put for the sensor you've got in the back of the camera, and each sensor is d designed differently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. Does Photoshop? I know Photoshop will correct. Um, there are certain, the, the, the raw program or the, or the raw, the program that you use to bring the images into Photoshop will do lens corrections. Is it, I know it'll do like barrel corrections, pin cushion corrections. Yeah. We'll do chromatic corrections too? 
Well, yeah, you can, you, yeah, but you have to have a base that you have to have something to hit it on. And even still, it's going to be, you know, what you, where where are you matching the middle of the, the middle of the of the of the, um, of the curve or at the end of the curve? Yeah. Right. You can't match the entire curve. It's impossible. But but with you know, the manufacturers try and make sure that happens. <laughs> All right. Gary, are, there, are you shooting raw? Yes. So um, one advantage of being in academia is I can dual purpose stuff that I get for research. So I have a, um, I have a, a micro SD card that I got for my um, faculty laptop that is um, a class 10, 256 gig card. Right, so I put it in a little adapter, I put it in my camera, and I have an ultra fast, almost bottomless pit to shoot with. Um, so I actually shoot in JPEG and RAW simultaneously, yeah. unless I want it, like when I was shooting the ISS, I was shooting just in, in JPEG, because I needed to get it as fast as possible to get as many images, and even then I screwed up. But you've um, never filled it anyways, though. No, I've never, I've, no, 256 I've never filled. Right, but it's- but Probably it's never not. filled the 16. What? You probably never filled the 16 either. When I shoot raw, I will. If I shoot raw and I'm shooting me uh, meteor showers, and I'm shooting 900 shots a night in raw, I'll, I'll fill a, I'll fill a 16 or 32 gig card. But 256, I'll never fill. The only reason why I use this one is because it's the fastest card I have. How many megapixels is your camera? 24. So it's an older camera. I mean, I got that I think in 2010 or so. They don't make this anymore. It's also a crop sensor camera. That's something I didn't talk a lot about. Um, so the crops, I'm talking all about. So the crop sensor camera, actually the good news for astrophotography is it adds to your, mag your magnification. So a 200 millimeter lens on my camera is like almost the equivalent of a 300 millimeter lens. Uh, so I get more magnification, which is good when you're trying to shoot telephoto, but it's awful, well, awful. it's bad when you're trying to shoot wide. So my 17 millimeter lens is more like a 25 when I'm shooting that. So, Gary? Yes, David. Um, a couple of comments. One, I've got a Trash 80 Model 3 up in my attic. Uh, <laughs> and last time I brought it down, it's still booted up. Plus, uh, Alan, I've, I've got a battery card I'd like to redeem for a free transistor battery. <laughs> if I can bring it by. You may bring it by. The only problem is, of course, we don't have any more stores left. That's right. That's I right. Think we still have them here in Canada. They're called the Source Mail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, so, used to, I, used, I used to love going in and buying a battery, and the guy would say, ask for the name. So I said, Greenspan. He says, how do you spell that? I said, T-H-A-T. And he started writing it down. <laughs> so, so I do have a question for you, Gary. Welcome. Yeah. <laughs> the, the equipment, and I know the pricing just shoots up, and it becomes an expensive hobby, so to speak. But aside from a good SLR, with what is the cost of the telescope and the T adapter just to get basic shots out of the telescope? And then the other question on that T adapter, when you're using the T adapter connected to the telescope, does that mean the T adapter is your lens and the telescope is really your lens? You're not using the lens on your traditional SLR plus the telescope? Correct. The, your, the, your camera becomes lensless. And you need to set, the, sometimes you have to set the uh, certain cameras, uh, there's a setting that will allow the mirror to move when there's no lens attached, because it, se it seems like there's no lens attached. This goes on where your lens would be, right? And then this screws on, and it makes a horrible noise into the back of your telescope, right? Right to the back of the telescope. Um, this is really cheap. I think I spent 30 bucks on, maybe 20 bucks on this. Telescopes are expensive, and the telescopes is where I think the slippery slope begins in terms of expense. Um, my scope, my six-inch Smith Cassegrain, I think was was 1,200 bucks, uh, although I'm not supposed to know that because it was a birthday present. Um, it um, it is really good for visual observation of solar system stuff and some deep sky stuff if it's dark. It's really not supposed to be used well for astrophotography because it has one, oh, let me see if I can put this slide back up. It has one arm and it's, it's mounted, it's what's called an alt as mount, as opposed to a um, German equatorial mount. 
So alt as mount basically is, is it, 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 it moves up and down this way and it rotates this way. Um, that kind of mount, it's very difficult to counteract the motion of the earth because it's not aligned <laughs> with the planet in that way. Um, let, me, let me pull up a slide real quickly. Let me show you this. You want to see a German equatorial? I'll have it here. Wait. Yeah. Uh, okay. That's the mount you want for photography. Uh, let me. That's a German equatorial mount. Yeah. You see how it's it's you want to you know, you're going to align that with the north with the north star, right? And it's got a wedge that'll tilt it up so you can counteract the movement of the Earth while it goes. Mine, I can't do that. So I can at best I can get um, just a, a few seconds of shots. Most of the shot belongs. The long shots I took were with my camera, right? Because this is a tremendously large, this is one arm, right? And um, it, it just does not, it, it moves the scope up and down and rotates the platform like this. It's not made for, made for photography, just the mounts. Javi, I don't know how much you paid for your mount, um, but the mounts itself for, for astrophotography are at least as what, what I paid for my entire telescope. What I was going Javier? What I was going to suggest to David is there is a two there are two websites. One is cloudynights.com and uh, the other one is I forgot the name, uh, but I can look for it, uh, where you can get a really good deal on a used um, telescope, a telescope and a good mount. Uh, as a matter of fact, my big telescope is uh, an eight inch SCT that I bought it from a graduate student that basically finished his uh, classes and he was going back home and he couldn't take it because it was big and uh, sold it to me like for 50% of wow. what a new one is. And with the mounts is the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Gary. That's how I got my first scope too. Stan? Counterbalance your telescope to your, to your camera. Yes. Your balance on the front of it. Yes. Check to see if it's if it's balanced. That'll work the same way. The other thing you should all be doing is making sure that your mirror is locked up. Just yeah. you, you know, once you see it, take a shot. You can also put a blanket or a towel over the camera. That 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 dulls the uh, vibrations. Oh yeah, I didn't think about that. Yeah. Right. So I have vibration pads on my telescope tripod that I some use. Some people put a put a weighted a weighted blanket over the over the over the scope like a telus almost. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, and it, and it just to hold it in place and keep keep the vibrations out. Yeah. Yeah. Great ideas. I didn't I didn't think about the blanket. Gary. Yes. One other one other uh, target. You had Saturn up there. Titan should be within easy range of, of that. And if you take one or two pictures on one day and then the next day, you should be able to see what's moving around there. Yeah, I found one image that I thought was Titan, but it was really, it wasn't terribly impressive. Um, I, I have an image of it. I, 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 I'm not gonna look for it right now, but, but I did shoot one image and I, I think I, I have it labeled um, Titan with a question mark on it, so I don't, I don't know. It could be. It's, it's big. Titan is huge, so you should be able to see it, and it's far out from the ring plane, so yes. it's, it's, it is relatively easy to pick up. You're right. Yeah. Uh, any other questions or comments? Your camera is off the shelf, or you basically modified the infrared uh, filter? You took it off? No, I was too afraid to modify the IR filter on mine. So the mine's a stock camera. Um, I've seen lots of really cool photos uh, from folks that have taken, I think Canons are the ones that are easiest to take the IR filter yeah. uh, off to get them on. The Sony is a little bit more dicey to check. Um, <clears throat> so I, I wasn't gonna play with that, but that's something that folks will do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, all right. Well done. Uh, any other, so if there's, in the absence of any other questions, I'm going to log out. I actually have a, a, a patient at six that I need to see. That's why I'm wearing a jacket and tie, that and also for Evan. Um, so thank you again very, very much. Thank you for attending. Thanks for the great questions and comments and contributions. It was great seeing you guys. Uh, I don't see many of you very often. Scott, wonderful to see you uh, in person. I haven't seen this been quite some time. Love, love, love to see uh, your little puppy there as well. Um, this is Dottie. She's with me yes. here.
Thanks, Samir. Gary, thanks, Samir. Thanks, Samir. Wonderful to have you. Thanks, Samir. Thanks, Samir. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Samir. Thanks, Samir. Thank you very much. Take care. Scott, we'll be in touch. Take care. Bye.